according to INS, here are the four different um, engineered securement devices. FDA cleared for securing devices. Um, this is just a, these are just samples, um, but uh, your adhesive securement device sticks on the skin, some part of the hub goes in there and it holds it. An integrated securement device is built in. This is just one example. A subcutaneous anchored securement system anchors subcutaneously and the tissue adhesive. And for, I saw a couple of tissue adhesive people. I'm sorry, that's the best I could do with the picture. It's kind of, I kind of squished it. Um, but what I found interesting in the definitions is that with tissue adhesive, they said temporarily bonds the catheter to the skin. It's no more temporary than these other, well, two of these, um, adhesive or integrated, both of those need to be changed every seven days. And this just needs to be reapplied every seven days. Um, the subcutaneous anchor is a little bit different. It stays with the device. My job tonight is to talk about securement in a couple of papers. It, it, what you do with this information and how you look at what's going on with your patients, I'm not endorsing anything. Okay, I could spend an hour just talking about the top half of this slide. Um, Suture-based securement, because we have all those engineered devices, is currently off-label. It was appropriate to use suture-based securement off-label when we didn't have four options for engineered securement devices, but some of you may still be seeing sutures in your area. And then creative taping. Um, tape may be an adjunct to your current securement device, but if you're using a lot of tape, I would evaluate what device you're using to secure it. You shouldn't be adding on a bunch of tape, um, but it's not really labeled to be the primary securement for vascular access. Okay, so how important is it to dwell the tip of the device in the optimal position? Well, what is the optimal position? When we're talking about CVADs, it's the lower one third of the SVC or the cable atrial junction or the inferior vena cava if we're coming up from the bottom. A suboptimal placement increases the risk of complications, but you don't have to believe me. I, I gave you a few people to look at down here, but there's a lot more. You need to put it in the right place in order to have um, fewer complications. So how important is it to keep the vascular access device in the optimal position? All right, well, I wanna talk about movement a little bit before we get to that. Internal movement of the central, the, of the CVAD happens, okay? Um, if your patient breathes, it moves. So we want them to breathe. Um, arm movement, it's gonna move a little bit. Coughing, vomiting, sneezing, gonna move. Change in physical condition. Say you put the CVAD in when the patient was in a coma and on a vent. And a couple of weeks later, six weeks later, you did such a great job that they're now out mowing the lawn. Little bit different securement issues for those two um, physical conditions. And there really is no securement we can do, anything we can do for the internal movement. It's gonna happen. We can't put a little weight on it. We're not gonna staple it to the SVC. Um, the only thing we can really do is we can impact the amount of internal movement by putting the tip deep in the SVC um, or at the cable atrial junction. Okay, a little bit of talk about dislodgement. In the INS standards, you'll see this. Never, I'm not going to read it all to you. Never advance any external portion of the CVAD that has been in contact with the skin into the insertion site. Okay, so basically what they're saying, the reason you can't do that is we can't sterilize skin. So if the catheter goes out a little bit and goes back in and goes out a little bit and goes back in, every time it's going to grab some bacteria and bring it in. Okay, um, so what is the acceptable length of the catheter that can go out and come back in? What is the uh, time on the skin? None. Never. Never. <laughs> okay. Um, so. Uh, recently, I had to write a, I got to write a blog about pistoning, and I thought, oh, that'll be easy. And I tried to look up what is pistoning, um, and we all kind of know what it is. I mean, we can describe it, but there's really no definition of how much is in a pistoning movement. So I came up with this um, 
definition that, that pistoning is any visible movement of the vascular access device, retracting and advancing repeatedly at the insertion site with or without securement, a securement device or dressing in place. So um, if it's day seven and you're changing the dressing and you have one of those three temporary devices, then, then there's gonna be a chance there. That, so you wanna be very careful that, that the catheter is not moving in and out while you're doing that dressing change at the moments that you don't have securement. Um, so that's, that's where I went with that. You all might come up with your own definition. So other external movement terms are also kind of vague. Um, retraction, it's sort of an ambiguous term about the amount of catheter that is out of the body, but not necessarily in relation to the original placement. So is it a retraction after the previous retraction that was a retraction from the week before? Where are we on this? Uh, migration is another fun one. Um, when I was part of the systematic review, I mean, the definitions are all over the place. Even if you call it a partial dislodgement within or slightly outside of the target area um, that may or may not trigger a replacement, that's sort of definite, isn't it? The reason it's so vague is that it's based on how much, where you put the catheter in the first place. It's based on how uh, flexible your institution is. Well, it's still in the SBC somewhere, so we're going to use it. Or is it in that optimal position where we have minimal complications? So that's kind of all over the place. Um, hopefully, Ava is going to like eventually have all these terms um, laid out for you. In dislodgement, you think that would be easy. It's dislodged, it's uh, out of the body and laying on the bedside table, or it's laying on the floor, or it's uh, hooked to that doorknob over there. But a complete or a significant dislodgement for the most part will trigger a replacement, okay? It's far enough out that the whole world knows it needs to be replaced. Okay, so when we talk about cost of the optimal tip position, it's really, really, really important to get that catheter in the right place um, on insertion. We spend lots of money with training and, and uh, technology, um, all kinds of things to make sure that we get the tip in the right place. Well, what do we spend and what do we think about keeping it there? Just think about that. Same with the time. We, we're so concerned about that first part, about getting it there. And that's important, um, but you could do that time on a stopwatch. But keeping it there, the securement part <laughs> of it is days, weeks, months, years. It's a long time. Okay, so I was just gonna touch on a couple studies. I was part of a systematic review. I was one of four, th four authors and we spread the net, net wide. We looked at over 8,000 things that were even tangentially involved with securement. We got it down after a long time um, to about 39 studies that had data we could actually use. Um, securement affects a lot of different things. It affects safety of the clinician, safety of the patient, clapsies, skin irritation, lots of things. But our two primary endpoints were safety and efficacy. Tonight, we're just talking about efficacy. In other words, does the securement do what it was designed to do? secure it in the optimal position. So I'm not gonna take a deep dive into stats, but here is um, just what we found um, with the uh, systematic review. And the N here are the number of studies, okay? This is your adhesive, integrated, subcutaneous, suture-based securement, and tissue adhesive. And number of studies, not number of patients. And at the time when we did this, we had, Five studies with tissue adhesive, but the number of subjects doesn't give you a really good idea of, of its ability. So I wouldn't want to say it's the greatest thing ever, or I don't want to say, oh, it never works. There's still studies. There's lots of studies being done with tissue adhesive, and there's lots of uh, good things about that. Um, and, but these had, like ISD only had four studies, but it had more patients. But basically what we can tell here is that based on the review, um, we were able to do a meta-analysis on this one thing. And if a patient has a subcutaneous anchor, it's a very high degree of um, certainty that, or, you know, that the catheter is going to stay where it's supposed to stay compared to these others. This, we marked it, but it's really not fair to tissue adhesive either way down here. 
So how likely is it that a patient will complete their therapy with one vascular access device? You know, kind of my goal. Well, it largely depends on what we secure it with. So recently um, online, there's a, a paper that just came out, an article, and I'm an author on that. And we looked at, at patients in a hospital in the UK. It was a retrospective study, so you know, weigh it that way. Um, but we had over 9,000 patients in over a million catheter days. That's a lot of data. Um, and when we looked at that, the removal, if you just looked at the removal portion on, was it removed because it was partially or completely dislodged? With an adhesive securement device, about 12% of them didn't make it to the end of therapy. They had to have a replacement. And that was almost, well, it was 944 patients. And we had, because they adopted it really quick, they adopted the, the subcutaneous anchor. We had a ton of data. We had you know over 8,000 patients there and only a 0.4% chance that the patient would have to have their catheter replaced because of partial or complete dislodgement. So the probability when we when we take all the things that might have caused the catheter to be replaced, including collapse, site infection, any of that, um, the probability of reaching the end of need, they don't need it anymore, with one pick, regardless of the reason for removal, secured by an, a, an adhesive securement device or a subcutaneous anchor, had a p-value of 0. 0.0001. And what that tells us is that that the securement was a significant factor in the likelihood of you actually reaching the end of need, okay? But I found this interesting, you know, adhesive securement didn't totally fail, um, you know, just 12% or so. Um, and the longest dwell time for these patients it, for this situation for an adhesive securement was 663 days. Now, here in the US, we would go, what the heck? I mean, that's two years. Why would an oncology patient have a pick for two years. Well, things are a little bit different in the UK. And so they tend to use picks for a lot of their oncology patients, and they don't usually bump them up to a port. Um, so 663 days, almost two years. And during that time, if they had a uh, dressing change every seven days, at, at least, they would have had 95 times that the that the securement was removed and reapplied and removed and reapplied. Okay. But the longest dwell time in this study for the um, subcutaneous securement was three and a half years um, with one device holding it in place the whole time through dressing changes and all of that. Again, I'm not here to tell you what to use. I'm just giving you a couple of papers that I was a part of. So in summary, I've got two minutes left. So um, <laughs> how many types of engineered securement devices currently exist for vascular access? Um, adhesive securement, integrated, subcutaneous anchor, and tissue adhesive. Notice that sutures are not on that list. Why is securement important? Well, the tip of the catheter needs to stay in its original and optimal position throughout the activities of daily living. And can you imagine having a pick for three and a half years? I had one for six weeks. I can't imagine having it for seven. Um, and through the activities of daily living, you want it to kind of stay in place. So now that you have this information, a real brief securement talk, what should you do now? Well, I want you to track your out outcomes, do research and publish it in JAVA, but if track your outcomes at least. Look through the literature yourself. There are new studies that have come out since the systematic review. So just dive in there and see what works for your patient population. Talk to the sales reps that have securement devices. Talk to your patients, ask them how it feels, what it's like, you know, what would, what do you think they would prefer? Um, how is it to mow the lawn when you have a pick sticking out of your arm? And this is the biggest thing for me. Don't accept securement failure as normal. Just don't accept it anymore. There, we can do better. It does us no good to spend thousand dollars to get the tip in the right place if we're not going to make sure it stays there. All right, in case you think I made this up, I, you know, here's some references. All right, that's it. Mickey, that that's, was great. Now I need to stop sharing and take on questions, which is usually my favorite part. <laughs> it's always fun.
So guys, do you have any questions for Mickey? You can either put your hand in the air and we will call on you, or you can put it in the chat and we're happy to have her I'm, answer for you. I wonder what physicians would say about sutures being off label. Yeah, you know, there's, so I've been, um, I have a three part editorial series um, in JAVA. The first one came out with the spring edition. The, the fall one is coming out. The first one was about getting the sutures out of um, convenience kits. It's crazy. Um, and the next one is about the safety of sutures and how it compares to other securement and then and, and needle stick prevention act and all of that. And the last one's about efficacy or do sutures actually do so much better than every other securement device. That's why we still use them. So um, you can look for those and um, talk to your physician. I think if we get them out of the kits and they don't have a choice, you can hand them whatever you've decided is the, the right thing. Absolutely. We're getting some questions in Mick. So let's start with the top and Mary's never used a uh, sutureless securement, um, not sutureless, well, the subcutaneous, sorry. When doing a dressing change, she wants to know if that device stays in the original device during each of the dressing changes for the life of the line. Yes, yeah, even for that three and a half year one, it does stay there the whole time. Um, I, I'm not gonna give a, talk on how to use it and all that kind of stuff. But if you're interested in a subcutaneous anchor, then, you know, Google it. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a non-CE event, so we can actually use brand I can names. actually use actual words. <laughs> you can, this is a non-CE event. So but I wanted to make sure I was talking about securement, you know, and not just- We appreciate just, that. We yeah, my two, my two studies though, you know, had a, a good amount of that subcutaneous anchor, so. Um, it That's did. Nice, nice picked it up as a recommendation. So I will do want to answer, can this class be viewed again? Yes, it can. So every week we take these recordings, we put it on Ava um, on our website. You can find it under news and then you'll look down to um, Ivy League or no education and Ivy League learning. So they're all there. The only problem with this one is you're not going to get the intro slide because I didn't hit record until after it. But I think you'll get the gist of it. You'll get all the information. You just won't get her intro slide, which was beautiful, by the way. Yeah. Are they able to like get a copy of the slides? Because I haven't sent you anything. So I would be willing to do that. They want that would be lovely. Exciting two slides. Yeah. If you would send those, that would be lovely. And I can, anybody that wants them, just holler out to Ava ED at avainfo.org and we'll get them to you. So let's keep going with some of these because we have quite a few for you. Well, that either means I they're interested or I really um, didn't answer any questions already. I think it's the latter. Okay. No, I'm kidding. They're, in, <laughs> they're interested entirely. How many centimeter migration from the original measurement should we be replacing a pick? Wow. Well, I would say that really has to do with the size of your patient. So if they're 6'2", um, and it was deep at the cable atrial junction to begin with, and it comes out a centimeter, you should still be good. If they're a neonate, and it comes out a centimeter, you're no longer in their SVC because they keep them higher when you place a pick in a neonate. It's a little bit different. Yeah. So, you know, how tall is your patient? How deep was the catheter to begin with? That's, those are things that, you know, we, you Left can't just right. say it yeah. migrated or it retracted. Well, how Absolutely. much, you know, so there's a lot of questions there. I think the best thing would be to put it in the optimal position and keep it there. And, Absolutely. <laughs> That would, that would be the best. You know, for, for adults, start worrying after two or three centimeters as a general rule, as a general rule, but yeah. assess, assess, assess. Depending assess. on where they placed it in the first place. Right. Yeah. Left is a little bit scarier than right. We, but like Mickey mm -hmm. said, everybody's different. <laughs> Darn. Right. Keeps it interesting. It does. INS also oh, you, you know, one thing I didn't touch on is you can use a combination of securement devices. And I'm allowed to say, mm -hmm. so one of my favorite combos <laughs> is secure cath with tissue adhesive during the first week or so, because it plugs the hole. So there, there's no pistoning because of the, the subcutaneous anchor. And then they've got the, the hole plugged. So that's 
I'm allowed to, okay, if yeah, I wasn't allowed are. to say that, erase it for the, um, you're 100% allowed to say it. Yeah, I promise. I promise. So non -C -E. we're good on these. You crack me up. I told you you were casual, Mickey. We're cash. INS has also has integrated securement dressings as a securement option. Were mm -hmm. those viewed or reviewed at all? Yeah, um, that's the ISD integrated securement device. I think it should be integrated securement dressing. Um, they were in the uh, in the systematic review, but the head to head um, at uh, UK Clatterbridge in Liverpool um, was only adhesive securement devices or subcutaneous anchor. And it was a couple different adhesive securement devices. Can I say? It was a yep. stat lock and grip lock were both used. So that's still in one category. So those are the two um, groups. Thanks. So did I hear you say apply liquid securement device with, sorry, Marianne. Did I hear you say to apply liquid securement device with every dressing change? Yeah. You know, I might have to pass that on, but, but, uh, According to what I understand with tissue adhesive is that, you know, over the, the span of a week, it will kind of slough, you know, thank goodness. I mean, you eventually want to be able to take the device out. Um, so um, it's sort of done all it can for a week. And so if you want to continue to use tissue adhesive as a way to secure your device, you would need to reapply it um, each week. Perfect. Um, what's you, your you had about? one up top. Um, Grab it. You missed. I I've it. never used the SAS, which is subcutaneous. When doing a dressing change, does the original device stay throughout the life of the pick? I think yeah. I asked that yeah. first. Yeah. Yeah. That was the yeah. first one. But yeah, yeah, it does. It it just holds on. It 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 grips it and it just holds on the whole time. Um and, and when you're doing a dressing change, when you have one of those devices. Um, it's kind of nice because you can move the catheter all around and clean really well. And you're not like freaking out of that, you know, that time between when you have to take one securement off and put the other securement on or reapply, um, you know, securement. So it's kind of, once, once you're used to them, they, it's kind of a cool thing. So what are, have, go, ahead. go ahead, Kristen, all yours. I was going to say, it looks like Mark um, wrote in here. What is your feeling about the many different names throughout the world for securement types and categories? Sometimes I think it causes confusion. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like the terms for movement, <laughs> external movement. Um, you know, there, there's basically the four categories, no matter, you know, whatever you want to call your version of stat lock or grip lock or whatever, it's still an adhesive that sits on the skin and then you put the external portion of the device into it. Uh, there's different kinds of tissue adhesive based on their chemical compounds, but it's all a liquid tissue adhesive, you know, what, what you call it in your part of the world. You know, so I don't know, and, you know, pipe up all you really smart people on this call, of anything outside of those four types of securement devices. And I think when you talk about categories and then you kind of figure out, well, what type of securement do I have? I think that's really something Ava needs to look at is some of the nomenclature. And I think Mickey Haas would be a perfect person to head that. Oh, I wasn't holding as... my hand up to volunteer. I'm not, <laughs> I was giving you an amen, but no, I, you know, I'll help with whatever I can. I love that. Now, when we talk about tissue adhesive as well, I know there's other, other tissue adhesive on the market but they also have a thermal um, expanse when they get on the skin. So if you use a, a dermabond and I've used it, it can, for like, you can't use it on baby, it'll burn their skin. So there's yeah. different combinations and, and <laughs> secure port is actually, I don't get paid by them, by the way. Um, yeah. <laughs> they actually have a vascular access claim yeah where others don't. Yeah, so yeah. You know, look at the IFU, talk to the reps. You wanna stay in the engineered securement device realm. So if whatever you're using fails, you know where to report it. So we have even more data on what's working out in the real world and what's not. Absolutely. I saw somebody say never advance it down there, but I couldn't read fast enough. Right, 
So Nadine's saying, do you mean to never advance it, even if you're keeping it sterile while waiting for x-ray? Like we do with with babies. Well, yeah, so. if you're keeping it sterile, but the INS um, dislodgement rule is basically there, that once you've laid it on the skin and slapped a dressing on top of it and walked away, you can't rip that dressing off and put anything in. in the sa But they also don't define the amount of catheter that has to be out and go back in. So is it one millimeter, two millimeters, a centimeter? What counts? According to them, any length that's been on the skin is bad. So that's where, you know, when I tried to look up the definition of pistoning for vascular access devices, really hard to define. So I went with whatever I can visually see going in and out. If I can't see it visually. It might be happening at the micro millimeter or nanometer, but if I can't see it, I can't fix it. And Nadine, to your point, is it better to leave it and put it in deep and you work with neonates? No. It's not mm. just wrap the external part in your sterile gauze and that'll, that will work. So yeah. what, you're, yeah. what you're doing right now sounds like it's right. It's just don't slap a dressing on top. Go get a coffee or go to the restroom while x-rays being done. Yeah. Just and then say, well, okay. you know, it was sterile. I just did it so I can now right. move it back in. That's what INS is saying. No, there is yeah. no. But I did the same no thing. I wrap it with gauze. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you keep it sterile, you know, it's yeah. like. Yeah. But don't put it deep in those those little punky pies. No, they're, they, they're special. <laughs> awesome. Do we have any other questions? This has been so much fun, Nick. Has it? It keep has. Me longer because I have another meeting after this. So, yeah. <laughs> and it's right now. It's okay, right now. Guys. Um, what else do we have? I think that's it. Everybody, thank you so much for being here today. We appreciate you, Mickey. Of course, we appreciate you for everything you do for us and Ava and the organization. Guys, be safe. We'll see you in two weeks. Ivy League learning. Take a survey. Please Thank take a survey. Okay. Bye, Bye everybody.